uh, I, uh, last time we talked about the 19th century and the idea of freedom. Uh, really, really serious freedom in John Stuart Mill. Uh, I want to show you the other side today. Uh, this is the other side. It's, it's, it comes mainly out of Germany, but England uh, falls in line also. So I did not say to you that you should read, or you may read, Hegel, who is sort of the grandfather of it all. Uh, that's H-E-G-E-L. Because Hegel is thick and difficult to understand, whereas Bradley this the person I suggested is a Hegelian in Britain and easy to read and, and really quite pleasurable too, except if you're like I am, I, I get mad when I read that stuff. <laughs> uh, now, this other side that I'm talking about astonishingly has its own idea of freedom. So what it means to be free, uh, you, you might call that Germanic freedom or German freedom as against uh, British freedom. Uh, British freedom is John Stuart Mill's view, you do whatever you want to do, you're capable of doing it, have at it so long as you don't hurt anybody else. Uh, the Germanic notion of freedom is quite different, and what you've got here in Hegel and in Bradley following Hegel is the conviction that an individual looked at as an individual, meaning by that alone and out of the context of a community, but especially out of, out of the context of a state. Now, I'm not talking about state like the state of Tennessee. I'm talking about states like there are states in Europe, uh, England and Germany and France and so on, that somehow if we're out of the context of a state, uh, our lives are not happy, our lives are not meaningful. Uh, basically, we have no significance as individuals. I, I don't like to read passages. But I will read you one passage out of this great book of Hegel's, as you can say, it's a fat book too, called The Phenomenology of Spirit. Uh, he wrote it in 18, 1807, or at least that's when it came out. And um, in, a, in, in good Germanic fashion, there's a preface and an introduction, separate. And uh, uh, the uh, preface is 47 pages. <laughs> no? You, uh, you just want to make sure that you get everything in there. And at the end of the preface, he says the following. He says, the share in the total work of spirit. I'll explain spirit to you in a bit. The, uh, the share in the total work of spirit which falls to the individual can only be very small. That means you and me as individuals. Because of this, the individual must all the more forget himself, as the nature of science implies and requires. Of course, he must make of himself, and herself of course, and achieve what he can. But less must be demanded of him, just as he in turn can express, ex expect less of himself, and may demand less for himself. So let me, let me, just, let me just say, what this tells me is that the individual is ultimately of no significance. Individuals, plural, are of significance. There's an important difference. Individuals means, uh, you know, us folks, no one of us, no one of us is important, but that there should be people is important. Uh, you see the difference? The difference is between what he calls the individual and the universal individual. The universal individual is a person who uh, is like any other person, highly dispensable, uh, not of any great significance, but it's important to have him. <laughs> it's, important. it's not important to have me or any one of you, but it's important to have people. You know, you, without people, there wouldn't be a state. But who those people are doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter. Well, I agree with your head shaking, but that's, uh, you know, uh, well, we're, we are dispensable, there's no question about it. We're being replaced by our children, uh, and uh, that's okay. Uh, but, but nevertheless, it's a little bit of a shock to realize that we are so insignificant that it really doesn't matter whether we live or die, because somebody else will step in and take our place. All right, so that's in the way of uh, uh, an introduction 
uh, when Hegel talks about freedom, when Bradley talks about freedom, they do not mean do what you want, so long as you don't hurt anyone. What they mean is integrate yourself into the social fabric. What they mean is serve the state, because the state has created you, the community has nurtured you, uh, you have no life apart from what the community permits you to have. Well, the moment I say that community, you see, the moment I say community, uh, that's American. Uh, Hegel talks a very little bit about community, but mostly talks about the state. There's a huge difference between uh, the way in which Hegel thinks about this in terms of the state and the way in which Royce, this is the last person I'm going to talk to you about, Royce is an American philosopher taught at Harvard, the way Royce talks about it, because Royce says it's all a matter of the community. And a community is us, so it does matter that you as an individual live or die. It does matter a great deal. That's more the American interest in individuality. Uh, Hegel has very little of that. Let me, let me talk a little bit about Hegel's background. I don't mean personal background only. Uh, Hegel was born in 1870, uh, and he went to seminary uh, because he was a very deeply believing Christian. Well, as he read and read, uh, this belief uh, disintegrated. It's not that he ever said that he wasn't a Christian, that he was not a seriously religious man. It's just that he thought that religion was an incomplete understanding of the way the world is. Somehow, the idea behind what he calls revealed religion, which is, which is Christianity, the idea behind it is the right idea, but it, it sure doesn't come across the right kind of way, he says. It doesn't come across the right kind of way because of a number of reasons. One is that Christianity, and, and not just Christianity, all of the Judeo-Christian uh, um, uh, religions, uh, is, is, is of the opinion that, that there are stories that we must tell. It's, it's what he calls a matter of picture thinking. We, 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 we think that you know, we, we, we identify the founder of the religion as a single person uh, who lived at a certain place. And a lot of people I know, some among you perhaps, think if it isn't that, then Christianity has no meaning. That's not Hegel's view. He said, I've got to bring Christianity up to date up, up to date means up to the 19th century, where it becomes believable again and where it is philosophically respectable. Now you may say, who the hell cares about philosophical respectability? Uh, well, Hegel does. He's a philosopher. And he wants, he wants to really, he, what he wants to do is to show that Christianity has an important message, but it's not the message that is promulgated in the churches. Well, what is the message? This is difficult to approach uh, because he has language that is um, stilted, to say the least. He talks about spirit. What he, what he means by spirit is really the human race. What he means by spirit is the indomitable internal dynamism of, of the human race. Uh, what I mean by that is you, you, you look at what happened uh, back in uh, the 12th century, for instance, uh, when it was, uh, people lived 30, 40 years. Uh, I, I, I always look, I, I look again and again at the, at the history of dentistry as to how bad things were. People lived in a single hut, and uh, on one side they relieved themselves of what they ate on the other side. And the, and, and the entire hut was... Uh, you know, less in size than this. Now, how they ever got children is a total bafflement. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, the, the way in which uh, the latrines work was that you would do your thing on one side of the building, building, the hut, and it would trickle out and then eventually find its way into the river. And uh, it's, it's uh, even into the 17th century visitors to Paris would in inevitably find themselves with some virus because the, the water was not clean and uh, other people had added their additions to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the water and, and, 
people would, would, would be deathly ill as a result of it. I, I, I put that to you about the 12th through the 17th century uh, to, to, <laughs> to consider, for instance, what we do when we go to Mexico. Uh, and and, and I've, I've been there and I made the mistake of ordering some side order of ice and uh, you know that was a big mistake <laughs> right? and consider how clean we are and consider how much things have changed in terms of uh, the way in which we carry on about each other have you been watching what's happening in Chile with those miners oh, yeah. huh would anybody have cared a hoot about that in the 12th century? Well, just let them die. They're, you know, the, the individual is insignificant. So what you do is don't worry about it. Uh, you know, there'll be other ones. You know, they got they got family members to go down there and continue the digging. Uh, not, that's not how we are today. So so what we've got is this incredible drive of human beings, incredible drive. To, to find ourselves in circumstances that are better, that are more caring, that are more health-giving, that are longer living. Uh, we live better and we live longer than any previous generation. That's a fact. That's not theory. So, so, so you know, and, 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 and we live well. So Hegel wants to say, you know, it's not God who does these things. It's the human race that does these things. We do it. Well, does that mean that there's no God? Well, Hegel hedges. He's hedges and hedging on this. On the one hand, he says, of course there is a God. I mean, he's got to say that because all German professors are employees of the state. And being employee of the state, you have to swear that you believe in uh, God. Hmm. You, you still do. I, tell you, I understand. Um, and, and by the way, I just learned that in Florida, one of my students got a job in Florida, you, uh, you have to swear allegiance to Florida. <laughs> he says he, 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 he couldn't get a key to his office, he said, until he swore allegiance to Florida. I mean, what, you know, what? I don't understand this. I mean, what are you going to do, drill a hole and sink it? Or <laughs> What happens, what happens is that Hegel fudges on this, but in, in effect, I'll, I'll short circuit it and I'll say this. In effect, he says, yes, there's a God, but there's been a mistake as to who he is. <laughs> it's us. It's us. I don't mean any one of us, but the human race. Because the human race is world creative. We create our world. We pave over New Jersey. Right? It's a very different world from what... Uh, from what we've, we've had. So it's, it's the human race that ultimately matters. He never considers the possibility that we faced a little while ago that we could all be wiped out because of nuclear war. No, human beings will always be here. Human beings have this fabulous sense that, uh, that we want more and we get more, and we do more, and we enjoy more, and somehow the more encompasses us the more. Okay, if there are any, if there are any puzzlement about any of this, uh, holler at me. Uh, hold up a hand, you know, make a nasty noise. Uh, yes, ma'am. I think you started to say something about comparing the state and the community. Uh, more of that, um, that I, I said something about comparing the state and the community, and what I meant to say was, and maybe said, but maybe didn't, was that the notion of focusing on the community is very American. The notion of focusing on the state is very much European. And I'm not now saying one is better than the other, although I think it is the case that one is better than the other. Uh, but that's another matter. Okay? All right. So Hegel, so Hegel starts his philosophical reflections with the prior conviction that what we've got to do is to understand. That's the fundamental drive behind him. The, the, to understand means to see how consciousness and self-consciousness 
consciousness and self-consciousness, that's his language, are really one. Now that's a little difficult to understand, but another way of putting the, uh, the issue is maybe a little better, a and that is he wants to show that the subject and the object are identical. If we could show, he says, that the subject and the object are identical, I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, the subject and the object are identical, then we'd be okay, because then we'd understand the nature of reality. All right, so what's the subject? The subject is the thinking person, the thinking person. All of us are subjects. But he wants to go beyond individual subjects, and he wants to talk abstractly about subjectivity. So all of us have in us this subjectivity. Now, let me interpret what subjectivity means. Your own perspective on your own life, which is in some respects unique. But even in its uniqueness, he says, it's not that unique because everybody's got some kind of perspective on his or her life. So it's not, it's not unique, but it's unique. Hegel loves contradictions. Every time, every time you find a contradiction, normally people would say, uh-uh, wrong road. Uh, we're, we, we, I've, I've got in trouble here. I've got to back up. Hegel finds a contradiction. He says, I'm on the right road. Contradictions resolve themselves, and in resolving themselves, we make headway. Contradictions are like the, like the wellspring of, of motion. No motion without contradiction. So Hegel is of the opinion that we've got to understand what subjectivity means. Subjectivity is taking the perspective of ourselves and trying to understand the world. That's subjective. Objective is this. It's that which we encounter as the other in the world, the chairs you sit on, the clothes you wear, the planets in the sky, all of that is objective. What we need to understand is that the subjective is the source of the objective. I'm going to put it in his language and uh, you can baffle over it um, because it's baffling. But he says, he says, when all is said and done, what we want to understand is how the objective is nothing but the subjective in its otherness. Well, you know, the object and the subject are other to each other, right? Like male and female are other to each other, right? So the otherness, we, we realize that somehow there is an otherness out there, but the otherness isn't anything but ourselves. In other words, we created the world. Now, we didn't create it uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing. We create the world out of, well, we're talking about what kind of world? Well, of course the planets, but he's less interested in the planets and more interested in the social world. We create the social world, and the social world creates us. That's the point that he's trying to make. So if there's anybody who is God, uh, it's that set of people that create the social world that we live in. That set of people is us. Now, that, don't, don't, don't think that therefore he starts worshipping any of you. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not what it's about. Uh, what, what it's about is a better understanding of where the dynamism of life comes from. And it doesn't come from matter. It doesn't come from objective life. It comes only in the state and the community. If I had confidence that I made this clear, I could go on, <laughs> but <laughs> I lack confidence on that point. Um, you, think, you think you're with me? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Spiritually is good. All right, I, I like that. So what is spirit? Uh, Spirit is the spirit of the human race. And that spirit of the human race manifests itself in history. Just exactly as the notion of the Judeo-Christian tradition is that God shows himself in history, so Hegel thinks that God shows himself in history. And how does, how does that happen? Well, he says, the state is the divine on earth. So the state is the embodied divinity. 
Uh, if this sounds sacrilegious, it is, it is, uh, but, but it's, that's what he says. So what you've got is a historical development ahead of you here. And the historical development is such that it begins uh, with Egypt, interestingly enough, that's where he wants to begin. Egypt, where only one is free, and that's the Pharaoh. It moves on to Greece and Rome, where some are free. Not many, but, you know, women are not free. Children in, uh, uh, in, in Rome, for instance, were considered the property of the parents. Property. And that meant for a while in Rome, in the early stages of Roman history, you could kill your son. You could kill your daughter. And nobody would say anything. He said, well, he must have had done something wrong. Uh, so only a few were free. Uh, in, Germ in Germany, in the 19th century, everyone is free. I'm going to have to interpret what free means. But Hegel feels that somehow history has come to the point where it can genuinely end. History can end. And he thinks it ends right there in 1820. History ends, and, and why does it end? Because the internal movement of history namely the movement in the direction of obtaining freedom, has been completed. How is it completed? Everyone is free. What's it mean to say that everyone is free? Well, it means a bunch of things. One of them is this. Everyone has the vote. Because remember, you're a citizen of a state. The state is in a position to demand from you whatever it wants, including your life and your property. And he says that clearly. Not in this book, but in another book. Philosophy of Right, he calls it. Uh, yes, sir? Did women have the vote in Germany in 1820? Uh, in Germany, that was a, a time of great turmoil, and they didn't yet. But that was, his view was that, um, that that's coming. And he was working to make it happen, which is a good feature about him. Uh, sorry. No? Okay. So... Uh, Everyone is a citizen. Everyone, therefore, has rights as a citizen. Uh, he's got some worries about children, but, you know, that's, that, that's always an issue. I mean, we don't think that children have full rights. They can't drink, for instance, not until 21. I always worry about uh, that 21 uh, designation. I mean, you know, I know some people that ought not to be allowed to drink till 55. <laughs> And you know them too, <laughs> the laughter suggests. Okay, so, so what, does it, what does it mean? One more time, what does it mean to, to say that we're free? It means on the one hand that we are voting members of a community, right? and uh, the way in which we determine our lives is not by directly determining it. I make up my mind what I'm going to do a la John Stuart Mill. Uh, what we do is we select people and send them to Washington or to Berlin. And there they make the decisions for us. So well, he, he has a magical word for this. He says, our decision is mediated. That means it's made for us. But it's made for us by people whom we authorize to make those decisions. In other words, it's representative. It's a representative system of government. Of course, he also adds that in Germany, and correctly, of course, because what was happening in Germany was right, um, there was a monarch. So he says the monarch completes the freedom of everybody, uh, even though the decisions are made on our behalf by our representatives, the monarch gives a kind of personal imprint, a pers personal uh, approval of it. The monarch, he says in one place, is like the dot on the eye. Right? The eye seems incomplete, but we provide the eye and the monarch says yes. In other words, very much like what's going on in England. You know? The British Queen does not make laws. Uh, Parliament makes laws, and the British Queen says, so be it. And, and, and there's no way that the, the British Queen would have a chance to say, I don't like this. Take it away. Well, that was in the 12th century, not in the 21st. All right. So that's one part of what it means to be free, to be member of a state, and as member of a state, make decisions in a mediated way about your own life and the lives of others. But there's another meaning, an additional meaning of, of freedom. 
And that's where it really goes against what Mill has in mind. Mill wants to identify freedom with desire. Notice that the fundamental idea that Mill had was, what matters is what I want to do. That's a matter of desire. Well, what do I want to do? Uh, well, I want to walk up and down. Okay, fine, you can do it. If you can do it, do it. No, nobody's hurt. It's desire. Mills, I mean, Hegel says desire is the lowest element of human nature. And to say that freedom connects to the lowest element of human nature is to be dead wrong about human nature and very wrong concerning freedom. Well, then what is freedom? Identifying myself with the best that's in me, the highest. And what is the highest that's in me? The highest that I have in me is doing my duty and being self-sacrificial. Now, self-sacrifice, we also value hugely. I, I mean by we, us right here. We value self-sacrifice. It's, it's too bad when you have to do it. Uh, it's, it's really too bad. You try to avoid it. But, but in fact, we say if somebody is willing to give his life for some other person or to be generous to the point of, uh, of where it hurts, uh, that, that we appreciate. I think that's a wonderful thing. But that's not what Hegel has in mind. Hegel has in mind self-sacrifice to the point of giving your life for the state. That's what he's got in mind. Give your life for the state if necessary. In other words, give your life when there's war. And from time to time there ought to be war. War is a good thing. Now you don't hear that nowadays. You know, everybody's grumbling about Afghanistan. Uh, everybody was grumbling about uh, uh, Vietnam before then. Everybody was grumbling about, or a lot of people were grumbling about the Korean War. We don't like war. Hegel does. Hegel says the following. He says, the trouble with people is that if they are in a time of peace, they go ahead and accumulate goods. Sound familiar? They accumulate goods, and they have a good time, and they really kind of like a bug in a rug, real comfortable. They're happy. He says happiness is worthless. Happiness is not what we're about. What, what we're about is to strip away all of these artificial happiness-making things that we, that we so love. This artificial happiness that we've got to strip that away and face our Lord and Master, comma, death. In war, all our external trappings are ripped off, and we face death. And that's what invigorates, and that's what excites, and that's what gives meaning to life. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have been in the Second World War. That was a, that was a hell of a war. Uh, and if you were in the Second World War, or if you know somebody who was, I know a number of people. They speak about that war with so much conviction, with so much delight, even though it was awful. You knew, knew a guy who fought at Guadalcanal, and uh, he couldn't stop talking about it. He, he, he talked all the time about it. this happened, that happened. He got, he got very seriously uh, wounded. Uh, he wanted to go back and fight. Never in his life, said he, never in his life did he have the level of excitement and meaning that he had when he was fighting and being shot at and almost killed. You, you, does, this meet, does this match your experience of, yes. with people? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it seems true. By comparison with that, going shopping in the mall is rather lame. <laughs> Why do you think we have all of those video games that the sure. kids play? Sure. Why do little boys like to say bang, bang? That's right. Video games, guns. Or why do we stay married? <laughs> <laughs> why do we stay married? The gentleman suggests, then, why do we stay married? <laughs> I, th I, I think I'm out of here. <laughs> yes, sir. Politics is the same thing, though. Sorry? Politics is well, politics, yeah, but you know, you, uh, well, I guess to some extent it's politics is. Uh, I guarantee you it is. I've been there. 
<laughs> Politics is the same in the sense that you can be, even though you're not physically dead, you can be pretty much dead. Right? Okay. All right. The well, danger is always there of losing your career or whatever it is. I mean, there are all, kind, all kinds of things that we do which, which puts us in danger. But if you're not in danger, you just, you don't have the feeling that you're living. Right? Why do we drive too fast? Right? It's fun. But why is it fun? Because it's because you're right on the edge. Right? Yeah, but somebody had a... Yes, ma'am. I have a very different experience with both my father-in-law and uh, my husband's brother. They were both in different wars, and both neither one liked to talk about their experiences. Right. The, n neither one, uh, neither your father nor your brother? Uh, Husband, husband's brother, liked the wars that they were in. Were, were, was it the Second World War? Second World War. Second That's very surprising because that was a war that people on the whole liked very much. Uh, it was very exciting. Well, you know, it, admittedly, it's nasty. But, but there is the excitement of you not being dead and others are. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, the, the idea is that maybe the issue is they didn't want to talk about it. That doesn't mean that they didn't have a ball. Uh, well, you know, that may be the wrong way to put it, but I mean, there, there's a level of excitement when you're, when you're on the line and people are shooting at you. There's a level of excitement which is... Is it more men than women who feel that uh, way? Is it more men than women? Uh, depends on the women. I have seen Russian army women who were just every bit as excited and vibrant about shooting people as, uh, as the men were. Uh, I think it's a matter of culture. Right? If, you, if, if women are expected not to be in the military, then they fall in line. I, I, there are some incredible women serving in the military now, and they're just as tough as the men, if not tougher. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a sex or gender difference. I think it's, uh, it's a cultural difference. Do you uh, think it's possible we're adrenaline junkies? Uh, are we adrenaline junkies? Well, e e I like adrenaline, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to have. And it's a necessary thing to have. You have to have the feeling that you're alive. And nothing gives you that feeling as much as being in danger. Being in danger, not only being in danger where you're running from something, but having some way of fending off that danger, like a carbine in your hands. Yes, sir. Was Hegel reacting to someone in particular who was trying to solve a particular problem or question? He was, he was reacting to what he thought was the modern world's inability to believe anymore the story, the story, the picture of Christianity. Right? That's what he was reacting to. Uh, he, he, want, he knew that Christianity was the right view, but he wanted to make sure uh, that there would be a way of presenting it that made a difference to people, <coughs> that made it believable in the 21st, 20, well, the 19th century, but even in the 21st. Okay, let me, let me go on. Let me go on and say, so freedom then means uh, the ability and the desire and the actual accomplishment of identifying ourselves with the very best in us. Right? Not the desires that we have. That's not the best in us. The desires equate us with animals. So it's an animalistic freedom that Mill is pushing as far as Hegel is concerned. He wants to have the kind of freedom that makes, it, makes us proud to be human beings because we are self-sacrificial, we identify with the best in us, we believe in the importance of doing our duty. Animals don't do their duty. We do. And that makes a huge difference. Now, uh, Hegel has a view of uh, the history of humankind, which is a very interesting one. I want to share that with you. Yeah, we're doing okay. Um, here, here it is. He says the, the, the history of humankind is the history of warfare. Right? It's also a history of the growth of freedom, which I already told you about. Warfare and the growth of freedom go hand in hand. 
What about warfare? Uh, it's a good thing that we know. I suggested earlier, because we give up our finite aims, that's another way of putting the same point, we give up our finite aims, which means our personal narrow aims, and we sacrifice ourselves to the greater whole. The greater whole, right? That sacrifice is what defines the quality of person that we are. The quality of a nation is defined by how powerful it is. Now, this is pure 19th century. I mean, this is, this is played out in the 19th century. Uh, so what does that mean? What it means is that at any given time in the history of humankind, there is a dominant nation. For a while, it was England, the 19th century. On the continent, it was Germany. Witness the German 1870-1871 war between Germany and France. The French didn't do well. Uh, the, uh, so... Uh, so, so what you've got, what, what, what you've got is uh, a, 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 a dominant nation, and that dominant nation uh, carries, as he calls it, the world spirit. It's as though God had anointed that nation. God had anointed the nation means uh, the, the nation is able to lick anybody, any, any other kid on the block. Right? So... Who is it now? Well, I think it's fair to say that it's the United States. For a while, there was uh, this uh, conflict between ourselves and the Soviet Union, and you know what happened to the Soviet Union. It sort of imploded. Uh, it's the, it's, it's, the real issue is, what's, what's it going to be when China really grows into the, uh, the power status that, it, uh, that its billion and a half people uh, demand? Okay. Um, so, what happens is that no human being as an individual has much influence over the course of history, except for a very few people, a very few people like Napoleon. He, uh, uh, Napoleon and uh, Hegel never met, but he was writing his great phenomenology, Hegel was, uh, in Jena, the German uh, city of Jena, when Napoleon came in after the Battle of Jena, and Hegel went out to see Napoleon ride into town, and he is reputed, he, Hegel, is reputed to have said, I saw the world spirit on horseback. Mm -hmm. The world spirit is God. I've seen God on horseback. That's another way of saying that this is the person who makes a very one of very few people who makes a huge difference to world history. However, you, you know that um, after uh, uh, Napoleon made that tremendous difference to world history, he made the mistake of marching on, on Moscow, and everything unraveled at that point, and, and Hegel says that's exactly right. God uses individuals like that God uses individuals and uses them up. So after he has squeezed them dry like a lemon, he casts them away. Uh, that, there are only a few people who are world historical individuals like that, and they were always uh, the generals or the leaders of huge armies. Uh, he specifically focuses on Napoleon, and he specifically focuses on Julius Caesar. They all do poorly. They shake up the world. Everything is different after they have been there. But they come to a sad end. Um, Napoleon, caught, um, sent to an island, dies a miserable death. Uh, Julius Caesar, you know, Brutus goes ahead and knifes him. That's the end of that. Right? But they made their impact on the world. They are the only people who make a difference. And they are called, according to Hegel, World historical individuals. World historical individuals who have passions that are oversized, just absolutely don't care about anybody. Um, such a, here's what Hegel says about them. He says, such a mighty form must trample under many an innocent flower. That's us. Right? We're get, we get trampled under because they're going to wage war and we're the shock troops of the war. And we're going to have to do that. 
But that's the meaning of life. That's how advance is made in the world. So world historical individual, we got that. And in addition to that, the world spirit, which means God sanctioning and inhabiting a given nation. There is a clear connection between the strength and the power of that nation on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, what that nation is able to accomplish, right? what that nation is able to, to do and demand for itself and take over from others and conquer and how many it can kill. That's really the might of a nation, and that's what it's all about. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. So in your, mm? in your giving that definition of Napoleon Caesar, is this where we often hear that um, it was Hegel's philosophy that in effect supported Hitler? Uh, that is, did Hegel's philosophy support Hitler? This is something that the scholars of the world disagree upon uh, vigorously. Um, uh, the reason is this. Uh, Hitler was a narrow nationalist. Uh, he was also somebody who maybe was a world historical individual who, who shook things up to a tremendous extent. But there's one thing he didn't have and that is success. His success was very temporary. Right? What you've got to be in order, in order to be sanctioned by God, you've got to be successful over a period of time. You, you've, got to be, you've, you've, you've got to lead your nation to great glories. Uh, it's not enough to slaughter a lot of people or else Genghis Khan would be a mighty fellow. Yeah, but he, well, I mean, that's right, there you are. Uh, th that's the other side. It was the uh, preceding class that, told, that yeah, talked yeah, about. Yeah, but you, you, you know, but, but, but the, the, the point is this. Um, the, question, um, the question is, it was Hitler a world historical individual? Uh, what are we going to do with that? Uh, would, 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 or another way to put it is, uh, uh, would Hitler's philosophy have been more or less identical with the philosophy of Hegel? Okay, let me, let me, let me attack it this way. Uh, number one, Hitler didn't read Hegel. All right? Number two, if he had read Hegel, he wouldn't have understood him. Uh, there, there are plenty of people that Hegel read, I mean, sorry, that, that, that Hitler read, but Hegel wasn't one of them. Uh, he read, supposedly, he read Nietzsche. That's another matter. We'll talk about that. Uh, but, um, uh, Hitler did not believe in the kind of state that was recommended by and, and, and exalted by Hegel. Uh, it was not a democratic republic, put that in careful quotation marks. It was not a matter of free elections. Uh, that was a very different state that he believed in under his sole leadership. So in one respect, clearly Hegel and Hitler don't go together. From another standpoint, you could readily argue, and as I said, it has been argued, that, uh, that they're very similar. Uh, one of the interesting commentators in a book uh, called Reason and Revolution is this fellow Marcuse who says the day Hitler took power, Hegel died, because Hegel is so different from Hitler. Uh, I don't know what to say more about that without getting into too much detail. Yes? But I think in many ways, Hitler very much had Hegel uh, values. The individual meant nothing. It's what you could do for the state. Although I, the, the, the question, or rather the comment, is that Hegel uh, had influenced in some fashion uh, Hitler because the Hitler also had this notion that the individual ultimately didn't matter. You're right about that. But I wonder if that was really Hegel or the social milieu. Uh, th there is a tendency in some states, 
perhaps not anymore, I hope not, uh, to take individuals as cannon fodder. Right? And, and that, means, that means you just, uh, <laughs> you don't care, you just feed them out. I mean, this, in, the, in the First World War, the Russian army was like that, you know, overrun everything because there were so many people coming that uh, you, can't, you couldn't shoot them fast enough. Right? So that sort of uncaring for individuals uh, is part of the culture of some states and used to be part of the culture of many states. Uh, so Hitler just tied into that. Okay. Uh. All right. John, Let, what is the demo, what's a democratic republic or republic democrat? Or what you want to say? Um, a, representative, a representative democracy, and if not democracy, it's a representative monarchy. Right? Because it was a monarchy in, in Hegel's day. There was a king. But the king was, if not non-functional, at least uh, did not make the laws. Well, we've gone around the world trying to get everybody to be democracy, and it's just a mess when they get there and get finished with it. Uh, to be a democracy, the, the, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, the, the comment is that uh, we go around the world trying to make everybody a democracy, or every nation a democracy, and of course what we get is a mess. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but now think about it this way. Uh, you can't just have a democracy without the necessary conditions of a democracy. Necessary conditions, which means we consider ourselves ultimately friends and citizens. You know, no matter how busily and miserably we fight each other at the ballot box and before we get to the ballot box, when it's all said and done, we have one person who is our representative. We have to senators who are representatives, and we don't kill each other over it. But we're not a republic, right? Well, uh, I, we're supposed to be a republic. What does that mean, though? Okay, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you want me to, I'll, I'll, I'll do a series next year on political philosophy. Uh, I, because, because, you know, to begin to, to, to talk about the republic is, is, a, is a long story. And, and it's a uniquely American story. I'm just talking about the fact that if, you, if people don't understand that we're not supposed to kill each other, and as they do in, still do in Iraq, because they're, they're different factions, and the, and the different factions, instead of going to the ballot box and then going home, what they do is they go home and try to kill the others. If the others win, then we kill them. Well, if you take that attitude, you can't have a peaceful nation, you can't have a democracy, you can't have anything. You can't even have a nation. So, uh, so we've got, we got to get to the stage where we build, if we're going to build these things, we're going to build the necessary conditions without which you can't have a democracy, which is, at the very least, respect for one another as citizens. Yes? Yeah, I actually have a different kind of question. It, it goes back to Hegel's relationship to religion. He sort of started, Yep. But then we're speaking about this universal spirit that is God, which sounds a little bit closer to at least Western perception of God. I, I, it's not clear to me really how he perceived God and where the and if he remained Christian or not, or if it was strictly a man. Uh, that's that's a lovely question. Let me repeat it. Uh, the, uh, the the question is. How in the end does Hegel come down uh, with Christianity? Is he a Christian? And if so, in what sense? Is he even a religious person? And if so, in what sense? Uh, that's, that's, that's a very sensible question. Uh, he is not a Christian, if you mean by a Christian, somebody for whom personal relation to God matters. He's not a Christian. I mean, that would be, that would be a Protestant Christian, right? He is not a Christian in the Catholic sense either uh, because he doesn't think that an adequate access to God is given through the mediation of a church mechanism of priests and uh, bishops and the like. Okay? So he's not a Christian in that sense either. But he is to his own satisfaction a Christian because to him Christianity means and, and good religion means the acknowledgement of the greatness of 
the world, the greatness of the spirit of the world, the greatness of the spirit that inhabits us. And that's why he ends up saying that if anybody is God, we are. Okay? Now, that is the very definition in some view, in, in, the, in the view of many Christians. That's the very definition of uh, sacrilege. You know? Because you know, how, how, how can we say that we're God? Well, Hegel thinks we are. Not individually, but as the human race, world creative. Yes? Uh, Schopenhauer, who was his rival, studied Buddhism a lot. Uh, Hegel did not. But, but, you know, here's the sad thing. Uh, there are overtones of Buddhism. This is the time at which uh, the sacred texts of the East are being translated into German. <laughs> and so they're available. And, of course, he reads everything, but he's not, he doesn't say he's impressed by Buddhism. The sad thing, let me just tell you this, the sad thing about this uh, controversy between this, this, this fight between Hegel and Schopenhauer, uh, who, both of whom were professors at the University of Berlin, is that Schopenhauer, who was an absolutely brilliant man, uh, did not have a following. Uh, Hegel had people coming from Russia and from Finland and all over the map just to listen to his lectures. Well, so what does Schopenhauer do? He sets up his lectures for the same hour <laughs> that Hegel is lecturing. So everybody goes to Hegel's lectures, nobody to Schopenhauer's. What does Schopenhauer do? He gives the lecture anyway. And it was, according to all reports, a brilliant lecture. All reports. <laughs> right? No audience. Can you imagine giving a lecture to no audience? That's terrible. Yes. Could you uh, restate the time frame you're referring to, uh, Hegel's lifetime? Uh, seven, se 18, pff, 1770 to 1832. Thank you. Uh, that's Hegel's life. Now, let me, let me go on for a second. Um, there is a very interesting view that Hegel promulgates concerning how history happens. It looks like history is just a bloody mess. Uh, and I mean heavy emphasis on the word bloody. It's a terrible thing. Nevertheless, he says, even though it looks like, even though it looks like human beings uh, use history to satisfy their own grand impulses. Certainly Napoleon did. Many of these, many of these generals and admirals and so on are doing that. He says, it looks like nothing but the passions of humans. It looks like nothing but self-seeking. But, he says, that's not the right way to look at it. There is something that he calls the cunning of reason. The cunning of reason is as though there were a being, as though there were a being, in other words, as though there were God, um, who arranges things in such a way that everything works out for the best. So things move along, and it looks like everything is lost, but we can't ever put ourselves in a position where we calculate the consequences of our actions. We never get it right. So since we never can calculate the outcome of our actions, it is a surprise to us that the outcomes are always something different than what we want. We want selfish ends. They don't end up that way. Selfishness is converted into the common good by the cunning of reason. Cunning, cunning of reason. So, so even though we don't mean individually to do well by anybody, we may be just as selfish as all get out. But even that selfishness is utilized by God, utilized by God to promote the greatest good. Okay? Now, utilized by God, translate. Does that mean that there's a transcendent God who, who sort of comes into history and looks at it and says, no, 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 these people really messed up. Let me see if I can sort it out. No, no, he doesn't mean that. He means that this is a, an, an in, intrinsic element of the process of history, that things work out for the best. So Talk of optimism. Huh? So he is an optimist. He is an optimist like you've never seen an optimist before, right? <laughs> and Schopenhauer was, of course, a pessimist like never seen before. It's a wonderful contrast. 
So, so what you've got, coming to you in one second, what you've got then is this idea. It's, this, it's a little bit uh, like a version of, the, uh, of Adam Smith, where, you know, if everybody just pursues uh, his or her own good, then the common good will be pursued also. The well, common good will come about. Well, in Hegel, it doesn't take economic form. It takes historical form. And what we've got then is everything working out peachy. Yes, sir? It, it sounds to me like there are two things operating here. One, he doesn't learn from history. And second, he's using a lot of magical thinking. Uh, the, uh, the, the comment is that, number one, Hegel doesn't seem to have learned from history. And number two, that he uses a lot of magical thinking. Well, if you mean by magical thinking, big words, uh, and a lot of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he does that. It's, it's a, he's got his own language. He's got a language like scientists have mathematics. And he, he, you know, you plug into that language and before you know it, out comes something. You know, it's like a sausage factory. In, wa in walk the hogs, out come the sausages. Very odd. Very, very odd. But, but, but that he has never learned from history. He, he, really, he really thinks that he has got it right on history. There's no question in my mind. He's got a little booklet called Introduction to the Philosophy of History. It's, it's his most readable work. It's almost readable. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and you might want to look at that. He thinks that he understands what happened in history. Yes? What happens to the rights of the min minority in Hegel? Uh, they're citizens. What happens to the right of the minority? They're citizens, so they have rights. Right? But but it does not mean that their, that their views will ever be properly uh, acted on or represented. They have rights in the sense that you can't deprive them of a vote. You can't arbitrarily arrest them. You can't throw the opposition in jail. Lot, so the minority will be protected in that sense, but only in that sense. The minority will yell and yell and yell, and the trouble is, Hegel says the, tr the trouble is that people tend to do that. They don't understand that that kind of opposition does not promote the good of the state. Does not promote the good of the state. Okay, let me, let me quickly shift. I think we've got a few minutes to shift to Bradley. Now, Bradley just imbibes this Hegelian stuff, but converts it into, into, uh, into British material. And, and as British material, here's, here's his line. He says... We are born, we're born to be members of a nation. In effect, he says, not so many words, but that's, that's the idea behind it. He said, in effect, uh, our genes are American genes, he says British. All right? uh, the, a British child, even if born in India, will be a British child, because not just because of culture, but oddly, just because of the parents. So nationality is genetic. Now that is a hell of a view. That's all I can tell you. It's a hell of a view. You know, it's very, it's very, it's very dangerous. It's very odd because it comes close to a racial view. Right? So, so you, uh, you say, well, you, you're a member of a race. That means that blah, 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 blah. And you can, you can tell that... Uh, that if the person is a member of that race, then they, he, he or she will do A, B, C, D, E. Well, that's, don't go there. That's just not how it is. But nevertheless, Bradley thinks that the child is a British child because it has British parents, so it's in the genes. But even if you forget about that, uh, at least, he, will, he says, that child will learn to speak the language. With the language come concepts. With the language and the concepts come a view of the world. With that come a bunch of values. Now, values to live by, right? Values to live on, right? So, um, so he says, there's no denying that we belong to a group, that we belong to a nation, that we belong to a state. And once you realize what, that you belong there, all you've got to do is, it's very simple, there's no moral problems. Who's ever heard of a moral problem? There's solutions to all these things. How do you know the solution to things? Let me tell you, it's very easy. 
look at the job description. If, you, if you've got a job description for what you're supposed to do and you do it, you're a moral person. So, if I'm a teacher, I'm supposed to teach. There's the job description right there. I'm supposed to grade papers, blah, 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 whatever, see students. If you're a student, you're supposed to study. That's the job description. If you're a parent, you're supposed to parent. If you happen to be a, a, you know, a, a, a chimney sweep, then you sweep chimneys. Do it well. Do it well. That's all that matters. And don't rock the boat. Now, you, you hear overtones of British a class system here. Don't rock the boat. Don't try to be more than you are. Uh, don't have overweening ambitions. No, 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 none of those. Just be yourself. And to be yourself means to be who you are expected to be. All right? Now, you don't like that, I know. I, I think we don't like that. This is far more open a country. But let me just tell you one thing on behalf of, um, of Bradley. If we really had a world like Bradley describes, I wouldn't have a lot of puzzled kids in my classes. And the reason I wouldn't have a bunch of puzzled, ki puzzled kids is because they'd know what they're supposed to do. Now, the ones among my students who know what they're supposed to do are normally the children of physicians. They know that they've been sent to college to become a physician. Right? <laughs> That's it. So it's uh, Now, you can't imagine, or maybe you can, uh, how difficult it is for one of these kids to be able to say, you know, I flunked chemistry. You know, organic chemistry is the magic door. I flunk chemistry, I love English, I hate the sciences, I can't do math, but my dad wants me to be a physician, all right? Oh. And for him to say at that point, you know, no, I'm not gonna do that, is incredibly difficult. But they do it. In the meantime, before they do it, they're totally baffled. They're totally baffled as to what they should do. I think it would be nice, not too nice, but nice, to have a society in which people kind of said, well, look, you know, dad was this, or mom was this, I'm going to be this also. That would be nice. That would settle a whole lot of issues. It would make for an absolutely rigid society. Right? Now, according to Bradley, it would make for a happy society. Because here's his definition of happiness. When what you want and what you're expected to do coincide, when the two of them are the same, you are a happy little person. Right? And, 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 and don't laugh at this. This, no, this is Hegel and Bradley. Right? But, but Bradley is more interested in happiness than Hegel. Right? Hegel wants a war. Bradley wants everybody doing their thing. Uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't say that right. When I say everybody doing their thing, that sounds like they can go on out and do things. But I mean everybody doing what's expected of them. So, so, uh, so what kind of a world would this be, a, a Bradley world? A Bradley world would be a world in which people would be reconciled to their fate, would do what is expected of them, and they would feel happy about it. After a while, they'd be, feel happy. I'm, I'm prepared to believe that. Now, it's also true that I would cry if I saw happiness like that. But that's just my problem. <laughs> Any questions? I think we've got five minutes of questions. What about freedom? Sorry? What about freedom? What about freedom? Well, freedom, remember, it means... Freedom means two things. Freedom means John Stuart Mill, being able to do what you want, okay, and doing it, so long as you don't hurt others. Uh, freedom also means identifying yourself with the best in you. And the best in you is when you get beyond yourself. Oh, let me put it this way. He says in the phenomenology, he says, you have to lower yourself to the level of a thing so that others make, make use of you. Now that on one level sounds like a good thing because we want to be useful to each other. Parents want to be useful to their children and so on. On the other side is horrendous. Because that means you're offering yourself as a thing, and we're not things. So freedom means lowering yourself, which means you identify yourself with the highest in you. Namely, that would be what Bradley thought. that's what Bradley thinks, that's what Hegel thinks. You don't like that. Don't want to think that. Okay, well, another convert for Mill. I like that. <laughs> yes, sir. Then why would they express 
express it as lowering yourself to the level of a state as opposed to raising yourself uh, to the level of a uh, state. Uh, to, of a thing, not of a state. Oh, I'm sorry. Lowering yourself to the level, because, because we're better than things. Okay. But you lower yourself so that you may be useful. Okay? Yes, sir. In Bradley's happiness definition, what I understood you to say was when what you want and what is expected are the same, is it understood but left unsaid and being able to do it? Of course. Uh, the question is, um, in, in Bradley's definition of happiness, that uh, uh, that which is expected of you and that which you, that, that which you do are the same thing. Uh, of course, what's assumed is that you're able to do this, of course. And of course, we're able to do it because we don't have jobs whose job descriptions we can't fulfill. We don't get jobs like that. Right? So, uh, so what we do is uh, take on jobs whose job descriptions we want to fulfill and can fulfill. The problem is, the problem we face is that sometimes it's not clear what job we want to do. And that's our problem, right? We don't, we don't know what kind of jobs we want to do. We don't know what kind of job description properly fits what we want to do. But in a rigid society, that's not a problem. Yes? I once had a friend a number of years ago who was from New Zealand. And uh, just at the time, about the time that uh, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, that was, we were discussing that. And, and he felt that the United States' this fundamental problem is that we didn't have a leadership class. That's definitely the, the, the comment, if you haven't heard it, uh, was that uh, the, uh, according to a New Zealand person, our problem is that we don't have a ruling class. Now, a lot of people deny that we don't have a ruling class. That we, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of people are said to be members of the ruling class. I never met one. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think it's a good thing that we don't have a ruling class, and I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a guy who helps us on, uh, uh, by cutting the grass so I don't have to do it. And he is so worked up about politics this year that he declared and is running for representative to Washington. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to make it. That's not the issue. But the point is that he can think that it's possible. And, you know, if things go pretty bad, he might just make it, you know. <laughs> And, and I like the idea that anybody can take that kind of, a, that sort of interest in, uh, in our business. It's our business. It's not my business. It's not his business. It's our business. So uh, I, think, I think it's good not to have a ruling class. Look, the ruling classes have been tried for thousands of years. Hey, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, now, Hegel is not concerned with happiness, though. Hegel is not concerned with happiness. Absolutely right. Not even his own. Not even his own. But he, uh, he doesn't mind. He didn't mind if there was a little happiness for him. He had an illegitimate son. I don't know if that was happiness or not. <laughs> yes? Was he a Christian? Was he a Christian? Well, you know, that's... Bradley. Bradley. Bradley? Well, you know, nominally, you can't be a Hegelian and a Christian in several senses of being a Christian. Uh, he, uh, he thought... See... Uh, Bradley thought that your religious views and your views of doing your duty to the state are very closely identical, closely connected or identical. Okay? Right. Yes, what? Okay, two more. John, if uh, Mill wrote On Liberty subsequent to Hegel, was it intended to be a rebuttal or a more enlightened? Uh, Mill did not have a very high opinion of Hegel. Uh, there, there are independent developments in these two countries. But on the other hand, you see, Germany itself had uh, a champion of liberty in the Millian sense. And Mill refers to this person, and that was von Humboldt. Von Humboldt was a high official of the state and wrote this absolutely incredible book on freedom. Uh, wasn't able to enact it, but he wrote it and uh, uh, almost anarchy, that kind of freedom. Uh, so, so uh, uh, no, I don't think Mill wrote his book in answer to uh, Hegel, but Humboldt wrote his book in answer to Hegel. 
and mail quotes Humboldt. Yes, sir. I assume that the Hegelian philosophy led to socialism in Germany. Is that because the state would have the obligation to take care of its own citizens? Is that what uh, uh, that would not be an outcome that Hegel would have favored, a socialism. Just as he would not have favored the other outcome, namely what happened to him at the hands of Marx. Uh, Marx claims that Hegel had to be set upside down, head down, feet, feet up in the air, in other words, completely subverted. Uh, but when you submer subvert Hegel, you're going to be able to understand the economic problems of humankind and how those economic problems, Marx said, totally distort our lives. So Marx was a kind of Hegelian. Right? Marx was. Uh, Hegel would not have welcomed that at all. Yeah. Did Hegel have any military experience himself? Yes, he avoided it. <laughs> that, that takes a lot of experience. Uh, did, did Hegel, the question was, did Hegel have military experience? He, 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 he was near the Battle of Jena. <laughs> Not too close, please. Uh, Hegel actually, there's a very interesting uh, life. Uh, he was hugely unsuccessful in getting jobs. Uh, I, just astonishing. Uh, there was another guy by the name of Fries uh, who got all the jobs. Fries is absolutely not remembered. He's a worthless person. But he'd always be there and get the job. And Hegel tore his hair. He was furious. He says, this, this charlatan, this no good bum. Uh, but Fries, only when Fries would give up a job would they call on Hegel. <laughs> Last comment. Yes. Yes. That he explored the naturalist? Uh, no. no. That's another from Humboldt. Thank you very much.